Hey everyone, welcome back to another year of Striper Season Updates with On The Water. I'm Matt Hefner and this is week one of our 14 week video series following the bite up and down the Striper Coast. We'll talk to captains, shop owners, anglers and more to give you the scoop on what's happening and where as striped bass migrate north over the next couple months. Last week, as water temperatures climbed into the low 50s around the Chesapeake Bay and Delaware River, we shared our first striper migration map of the year. Mature breeder class fish are moving up into the rivers to spawn and before you know it, they'll be reaching the waters of southern New Jersey. This week, not too much has changed. A massive cold snap consumed much of the northeast and as a result, migratory schoolies and holdover bass got lockjaw. Now, as we head into the first week of April, southern New Jersey is beginning to experience the first major push of migratory school east striped bass. The recent full moon on March 18th was the last one of the winter, and as a result, big schools of Menhaden have begun to make their way north into Jersey's backwaters, signifying the start of the striper migration. This week, we're kicking things off in South Jersey, where the striped bass season began exactly a month ago. Today, I'm talking to Brian Williams of Bad Fish Charters in Ocean City. Brian, tell us a little bit about what you do down there when it comes to targeting stripers this early on in the season. Hey, Matt. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, so this time of year, yeah, things are still starting off a little cold again. We got set a little backwards with this cold front. Everybody's feeling it right now. We were just talking about that a moment ago. Um, but generally speaking, uh, most of these fish are still channeled up, and I'm assuming they'll be even deeper now that we just got hit with this cold snap. I mean, there was ice on the marshes this morning when I was driving down the road. Uh, but I'd anticipate that to change real quick now that the sun's high and strong again, and some of those fish will climb back up on the flats. It's been a weird start to the season overall. Um, dynamic was a little different than other years. The fish weren't super channeled up. I was getting a lot of my fish, even off the get-go, up on the flats and in the shallows. Um, whether that just meant there just wasn't as many fish in the channels wintering over this year or not, it's hard to say. Um, you know, but it was just a, a different dynamic. Uh, but we were still getting the bass. Uh, it was nice to get them shallow early on. Normally, I have to wait a couple weeks for that to come together. Uh, water temps, they've been hovering right now prior to this cold snap, right around 53-ish in the backcountry. Uh, ocean front was more like 45 to 48 zone. Uh, so the incoming tide definitely would feel that in the back. It would get cold in some of these. What temperature do you think, uh, you know, the bass usually like are really keyed in and start feeding hard? I think it really just depends on location, yeah, location and presence of bait. Uh, so as long as it's in the 40s, those bass are going to feed, especially if you have some sunlight out. Uh, they'll want to sit along those channel edges uh, anywhere that has an outflow that might have some mud bottom that's letting the nice warm water fall into the channels um, they'll end up in a lot of those areas to start things off uh, but staying deeper like i mentioned this year they seem wanting be wanting to stay shallow that's great it's fun oh yeah but it's just unusual for the month of, month of march yeah, so it's definitely, it sounds like it's keeping you a little bit closer to shore. So it, are you seeing, like, what kinds of bait are you seeing pressed up against the shore? I mean, do you guys get a, a, a big herring run down there? Are you seeing mostly grass shrimp that the bass are popping on? Uh, the grass shrimp, they're there all the time. That's what they always eat when times are tough, as I say, meaning just the coldest of the cold. If they're hungry, the grass shrimp's always there for a snack. Um, everything else kind of just comes and goes. The herring, I haven't seen any herring to speak of this year. Uh, normally, historically, we would have seen some runs, uh, but the, you know, the last decade or so, they've really been missing. Uh, but what we've seen a big influx of this season has been a lot of the bunker, uh, the adult Manhattan, as well as some of the smaller ones, the peanut bunker. Uh, we've been seeing a little mix of those, mostly the adults, though, and they've been all over in the backcountry, uh, all over the channels. I mean, shoot, I put it at the boat ramp, and all of a sudden, my screen marks false bottom because it's a pile of bunker right there. Uh, no way. So that's been really good. Uh, that's a great food source for a lot of these fish. And you're finding a lot of these fish are coming up, you're catching them, and they even have their throat stuffed with another bunker uh, from something previous that they were eating. It's also keeping the osprey, the eagles, things like that feeding well, uh, as well as if you notice the post I put up uh, two days back, uh, there was hordes of gannets just inside the inlet and in that area feeding on those bunkers. So, I mean, in, if they're feeding on adult size bunker, how does that impact what you're throwing? Are you throwing mostly like plugs early on in the season or are you trying to throw soft plastics and, and kind of jig them up? And uh, I would imagine the water temperature has something to do with that as well. Uh, not as much the plug game, because like I said, a lot of these fish are channeled up and they're a little deeper. It, it can be difficult to call them up. These aren't active feeds that you're pulling up to on these bunker schools. Uh, a lot of cases, the bunker are there. 
and then the bass are just in that vicinity shadowing them. Um, you're not really pulling up on active feeds where they're pressing them in the banks, things like that. Like you might see later on, or you might see when they get out in the ocean. Um, I just think a lot of these bass are just taking advantage of so many bunker out there, possibly, you know, a couple bunker drop dead, lay on the bottom, and then they just come in and slurp them up. Um, but it seems like there's just been a lot more bunker than usual uh, this year. I mean, they were pushed all the way up miles up into the rivers to the freshwater line. Even you're, you're spotting adult bunker schools up there, which is just great for the ecosystem. You know, do you, do you use your electronics to kind of cast net live bunker and live line or chunk or anything like that? Or are you pretty much strictly artificials? Strictly artificials, at least in the back country. Um, you could try live lining in this bunker, but like I was explaining, it just seems like they don't respond well to that. Um, it seems like they'll still respond better to something moving, you know, actively moving like an artificial. You know, it's difficult to just cast and reel back a bunker over and over and over. It just kind of puts more wear uh, on your equipment as well as just on the angler. So it seems like, uh, you know, more or less throwing things like this are my go-to, at least uh, when these bass are channeled up, uh, regardless of forage. That's pretty much my go-to. It's a five and a half inch DOA, uh, the jerk shad. And it just seems to be good all around that they can't resist. Sometimes if I want a slightly wider profile, um, anything like that, this is the DOA bait buster. I'll usually throw this out there. Um, usually like this one's three quarter ounce uh, lead they have in this. Um, and usually a three eighth ounce is it. And I mean, I'll be fishing, moving current down to like 20 feet of water. As long as you flip it up current and accommodate for that sink rate, you're able to get it down to the bottom and swing it in their strike zone. Yeah, and it seems like something with that, you know, finesse kind of subtle action early on in the season is, is really key to producing a bite, especially when they're hugging the bottom like that. So, you know, are you typically running your jigs low and slow? Or what's your tactic? Depends on the mood of the fish. Generally speaking, though, this time of year, those fish have been pinned to that bottom. And if that thing's not crawling across it as if it was possibly a crab, they don't seem to want to go after it. Uh, that's just the nature of what they do when they're channeled up. When I get them a little shallower and I'm up on the flats, that's different. That's more of a cast and retrieve fishing. Uh, whereas in this time of year, it's more or less just get it pinned to that bottom, slightly move it a little bit, and just wait for them to slurp it down as it swings by or under your feet. Um, trolling motor is key to success with that in a lot of cases because you're able to anchor up right over top of the fish, hit the spot lock on the trolling motor hold in place. And then if, if you fall off them or lose them, just start to meander around the area a little, see if you locate them again, or in those cases, maybe do a little cast and retrieve, just dump a lot of line out. So it gets down near the bottom. Um, you know, a lot of these depths you're fishing could be anything from like seven to 20 some odd feet of water. Are you looking for fish or are you looking for the bait itself? And then, you know, kind of fishing based off what you see in terms of bait. Uh, it's all about finding the fish. That bait, I mean, I, I could run miles of backcountry and see bait everywhere. And you watch that screen, there's just no predators under them. That's just the unfortunate nature of modern times. Uh, so is there any particular kind of structure you're looking for when you're targeting bass in the backwater? So, you know, are, are you looking under bridges or are you looking, I know you said deep water in particular is usually where they're stacked up, but, you know, they tend to cling to structure a lot of the time as well when they're stacked. So what, are, what exactly are you looking for? Well, a lot of that bottom that I'm working, they're all areas that used to have oyster bars and things like that historically. Um, now most of that's dead, but the shells still remain on the bottom. You still have hard bottom with a little bit of growth. I'm assuming some sea sponges, sea fans, things like that on that bottom. Um, so that tends to attract them to those areas. Uh, as well as bridges, that's always an option. That bridge structure, that vertical structure, they always key in on that. Um, as well as different lumps and contours in the bottom. Um, that's key. It creates those little rip lines that we can see on the surface, as well as those current breaks near the bottom that they'll want to hang near. Um, the other thing to make note of is just knowing the water temps and how that water moves in and out of the bay, because uh, those temperatures can be everything. You know, if you have a cold tide coming in, that area that they're in, they might shut down for that stage of the tide. But then flip the tide around and it's falling, that tide warms up a couple degrees. All of a sudden, they activate again. Uh, a great example of that would have been, I'll rewind maybe five days back, maybe a week back now. Um, I'm working this one creek, and I, I'm a couple turns in, nothing, lifeless. A couple days earlier, there was a lot of fish holding in there around that stage of the tide. Um, but we had a slight temperature drop from a cool down overnight. And the tide was coming in and flooding in a little higher than it normally would have been. So the water temp I was fighting on was around 48, 49. Now, any other day, that would have been a good temperature to see. But because it's been so warm the last couple of weeks, that's a cooler side of the temperature that they want to hit on. 
I went up an extra turn or two. I mean, no more than 100 yards up. I saw a three-degree temperature increase, and then there they all were. I mean, I'm watching my uh, Simrad machine, and you can just see on there, all of a sudden, there's all the fish. In not really a specific area where it was like, oh, there was good structure here, here or this or that. It was more just that's right where the line of warm water was. So it's possible that tide was just chasing them further up that creek, and they were following that warm water uh, as far as they could go up and until tide flips and they'll go the other direction. So, so do you feel like there's a like there's a magic tide this early in the season, like you know, end of or towards the end of the outgoing or top of the incoming or something like that? Is is the the prime time because of that warm water uh, concentration? Uh, so, tide as long as you know where to go and how they'll relate to those temperatures um, can almost be irrelevant, but it can be relevant at the same time in the sense that those areas where they might shut down, let's say on an incoming tide on you know the top half of an incoming maybe low tide those areas could be red hot but if you go further up the creek like i was explaining in this one instance uh, those fish will still be up there and feeding even on that top half of an incoming um, you've just got to watch your machine you know, make sure your transducer is reading temperature accurately and things like that that can be everything and figuring out where they'll want to feed and where they won't this time of year um, sometimes it's just something as little as your machine might show a warmer temperature and you think oh this is great but because of the way the currents are, the bottom might not be that same temperature at the time. So if you're unhooking a bass, you might notice one feels ice cold, a different spot, that bass feels really warm to the touch. Um, we've been seeing a lot of that, a lot of those contrasts. And I, I just think that's typically the theme this time of year. So, so in terms of the size of the and class of fish, what, what are you really seeing this time of year? I mean, you guys are a month into your season down in New Jersey. What, what are you seeing? And is that typical of this time of year? Uh, generally, what we're seeing this time of year is mostly uh, those schoolies, anything from 20 inches up to 30 and change. Um, on the bigger side of things, the bigger fish have been coming in around maybe 36 inches or so. But we're seeing that change over now. A lot of those fish that we were catching, they've pushed out and headed up your way up north now. Uh, those were our winter holdovers. Now we're seeing a changing of the guard where we're going to start to see some of our fish migrating in for the season, whether they're going to stick it out into the summer or not just depends i feel like on the individual fish um, a lot of them will be mixing with our residents that are here pretty much year round um, so i'm expecting a slight up in that size class we'll see more of those females coming in uh, starting to prepare to spawn and heading up into the river systems up to the fresh water uh, shortly uh, possibly after this cold snap even so for people that are looking to maybe get on some real good bass fishing in the Ocean City or Atlantic City area this year, you know, how can they book with you and what can they expect when they go out on a charter with uh, Captain Brian Williams? Uh, as far as booking, you can look me up. Um, my website is ocnjfishing.com uh, or you can look me up on the Instagram. It's C-A-P-T-B-R-I-A-N Williams. Uh, and that's on Instagram as well as Facebook, Bad Fish Charters OC. Or just give me a call. Um, my number will be uh, most likely listed in this description or it's on my Instagram as well. I hope everybody has a great season, gets out there and catches some fish. Um, just remember this time of year especially, um, we're going to be facing some of those spawning fish. So it's really important to keep them in the water when unhooking them. Uh, try not to stress those females too hard because uh, we need every one of them right now to rebuild this stock. That's a great finishing note. Awesome. Thanks a lot for your time, Brian. I appreciate it, man. Hey, take care. That's all the time we have for this week. Special thanks again to Captain Brian Williams of Badfish Charters in Ocean City for joining us. To learn more about Badfish Charters or to book a trip with Brian, click the link in the description down below. And if you haven't already, sign up for Striper Cup using the link in the description as well. Make sure you like and subscribe, follow on the water on social media, and check back next week for more news and updates on the Striper migration.